We've got roughly 10 minutes, and what Dita has done is brilliantly frame the next three sessions that will run in parallel around how we work on natural capital. Um, so I can, I've got time to take some very short, pithy questions. But before I do that, Dita, moving to the, from the theory to the practical action, one of the things I'm really keen to see that we focus on are the pioneers, but also linking the pioneer projects with um, some of the work of the industrial strategy, where, again, focus on different places to start delivering whilst we work this more complicated picture out. Yes, I mean, I mean the 25-year plan and the industrial strategy and the clean growth uh, plan, all of those things should be core bits of, in, uh, of economic policy. They all should fit together. And the bit that's missing is the green infrastructure. It's just as important as the other component parts. But the industrial strategy is a framework for doing that. Exactly right, we should be in on that game. And I think it's for everybody in this room to work out how we join up different organisations, different departments, mm. to make sure that we're running this theme through all the decisions that we're involved in. Some questions, and please, over here. We've got mics, yes, second row. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Dan Pescott. Um, I represent Wildlife and Countryside Link, a coalition of 47 environmental NGOs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Helm, for that really interesting um, speech. Um, we're following very closely the work that you do and the 25-year plan. Um, I'm just interested in uh, perhaps hearing a little bit of elaboration on what you said when you mentioned that uh, the Natural Capital Committee has advised the Secretary of State um, on the need for legislation to underpin the yeah. aspirations of the 25-year plan, and that's something we're very interested in. Yeah. Thank you. And can we move the microphone here to in the middle, and then I'd like a question from over here. Um, th thank you. Hi, D uh, these are John Varley, Clinton, Devon Estates. Hi. Uh, you described a breakpoint in the agricultural industry, and it's a huge breakpoint and all the farms I'm involved in, um, whilst a lot of them get it and are up for it, are not ready for it. Mm. And this potentially could be quite a car crash in the industry. Mm. And maybe that's a good thing. So what is your proposal for how we move from where we are today to where you want to get to, which allows a, an effective transition? Yeah. Right. So would you like to answer those two questions yep, whilst we get quickly. the mic over okay. to Richard so, there? So on legislation, the Natural Capital Committee's posi up, position is... Um, pretty clear in our formally published advice to the Secretary of State. We have not defined what we think legislation ought to contain, and it's not even clear that that's actually part of our remit to do that detail. But, um, I mean, I published a series of things on um, uh, taking this stuff forward, and there are a host of dimensions which are absolutely critical with view to the fundamental idea, which is this must be entrenched. So the legislation is about cement. It's about no going back in the frame. On John's part on um, agriculture, I, I agree entirely. Nobody's suggesting that you should switch from regime A, which has been built up over 25, 30, 40 years. In fact, British agricultural policy was very similar since the Second World War, to regime B overnight. There's got to be a transition. Okay? And the really difficult bit, which many environmentalists may not engage with, is it means the land price will fall other things being equal. And that's a capital loss to existing farmers. It's like taking mortgage tax relief away from uh, people who bought their houses. And so you have to manage this extremely carefully. But you can get on with it. It doesn't take five years. It doesn't take four years to 222 to, to, to wait to make some progress. And the crucial thing in that interim period is to set up the principles, set up the framework so everyone understands the rules, so farmers can prepare in advance for what's coming, and then concentrate and, and clearly identify which are the public goods. And I hold the view that the farmers who are in the most vulnerable position, upland farmers in particular, but there's some lowland farmers, they're the ones who are going to be the largest net beneficiaries of the switch of the regime to public goods, because they provide them. So it's going to be, and remember, it's in the envelope of the three billion, right? So the net position of the uh, farming industry is exactly the same. So it's some winners, some losers, and you have to be very careful about the losers in any political process. Now, of course, the risk here is that, quite rightly, the Treasury says, well, you know, it's health education. What the hell are we spending three billion on farmers? Because they only produce 0.7 of the output. Well, they don't. They produce a lot more output if we take the public goods into account, and we have to explain and justify why those subsidies should be paid. But a transition, yes. 
a recognition of the fall of land values and a concentration on the marginal farmers who environmentally, because we've trashed a lot of the intensive larger farmlands, those are the ones who are going to get a livelihood. Because otherwise, I come back to my Exmoor example, I was looking at a farm in Exmoor because I thought it might be an interesting natural capital experiment. There's no way those farmers could make a living at £5,000 an acre. But in a world, if you look at their public goods they're producing, it's fabulous. And that's what this subsidy change is about. Great. Can we take the next two questions yep. and keep both the questions and answers short? And then we've probably got time for one more round. So over there and over here. And keep your hands up. So, yes, please go ahead. Thanks very much. Rich Membo from the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. Uh, we're instinctively attracted by the idea of a single natural capital uh, indicator, as you described, Professor, as opposed to the individual outcome measures. But you run across this problem that uh, a treatment wetland is potentially worth more in natural capital value if, if diffuse pollution from farmland goes up, that uh, the value of your uh, oil and gas stocks increases as uh, worldwide stocks fall. Um, is there a solution uh, to that that would make this measure meaningful and avoid perverse outcomes? And is it that maybe a one in, uh, uh, one out, all out beneath that for individual natural capital assets can, can be a meaningful measure? Brilliant. The question over here, and can you pass the microphone over to the woman over here? And I need one more um, question. Hi, Alistair Driver, Rewilding Britain. Hi, Dieter. Um, it, it links to a point, actually, that you just made just at the end of the last statement, but there is a, we are speculating now what, what might happen with this uh, public uh, money for public goods approach. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the conclusions I'm coming to is that there could be this concentration of industrial scale farming, uh, which, which has uh, significant impacts on the environment within the rules and regulations that we have. And then, of course, in other places, there'll be a much more sustainable, uh, wilder, uh, situation where farmers are extensively managing their land. Is this, is this um, a, a likely outcome from your perspective? And if it is, how do, we, how do we mitigate that? Great, thank you. And can we get the microphone over to this gentleman over here? Would you like to answer? Shall I get on these yes, two? Yes, yeah, so sorry. sorry. So, uh, Richard, the answer is uh, the difference between outputs and assets. So if you take the core natural assets and treat them as assets in perpetuity, then you have to provide capital maintenance to maintain those assets through time. Okay? Now, where it becomes interesting is where there are enhancements beyond maintaining what we've got. So you've got these fantastic wetlands. Okay? So our starting point is they should not go backwards. And there should be sufficient resources to make sure that they're at least as good tomorrow as they are today in all the various dimensions of the outputs they come. And it might be we want to do something about diffuse pollution, which makes your asset better, or it may be we want to spend it on there. The enhancement issue, then you have to take into account who benefits, and that who benefits is not just a narrow cost-benefit analysis, marginal analysis that economists do. It's a question of how it relates to the environmental systems as a whole. And it's, I'll give you a long answer, but the short answer is most of economics is focused on cost-benefit analysis on a project-by-project -project basis. And what I've learned over the 11, last seven years is that the environment comes in systems, not marginal chunks. And so the idea in the accounts is, are the environmental systems kept at least as good as they were? On Alistair's question, very quick answer, um, it could be the outcome. Apartheid between industrial intensive polluting agriculture and good environmental assets, but it doesn't have to be. That's where about pricing the pollution counts, because we're interested in the pollution not just from marginal farms, but we're interested in pollution from intensive ones. But remember to something the Secretary of State said, which I think is very important. There is amongst environmentalists a sort of fear of technology. Actually, a lot of what's coming on the technology side is fantastically helpful. So we will be able to know, to the square metre, exactly what's going on on our land. That's a breakthrough. No more set aside, but we're not really doing it, and let's complain about inspections. We will know. We will know about precision applications. We will know a lot more about soils. So let's find that out. But it could happen, and it could happen if this is done badly. So it matters the detail. Brilliant. The last two questions, and again, short and precise yep. um, Q&A. Over there. I'm Belinda Gordon from the Campaign to Protect Rural England, and I was really encouraged by what you and the Secretary of State said about 
the importance of things that can't, it's hard to put a direct monetary value on, such as yep. beauty and landscapes. Yep. But I wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on how we can make sure that those things aren't left out of the natural capital approach and that we do protect them in future. Yep. And over here, please. Uh, in a world where we're moving to incorporate... Could you say who you are? Sorry. Bruce, sorry, Bruce Tozer. I'm a farmer and yeah. I'm also involved in environmental finance and yeah. ag technology. So if we're going to in internalise polluter pays and externalities within the UK and enhance yeah. natural capital, which is great, how are we going to, in a world of greater trade and free trade, make sure that there's compensation and pricing into that for commodities and goods coming in from abroad? Does that necessitate yeah. an export, uh, yeah. an import tax yeah. For, yeah. For, for the pollution side? Yeah. Um, CPR question, sorry, I, I, I didn't catch your, your name, so I apologise. Um, uh, it's incredibly important, first of all, to have an asset register, to be clear what is to be included. And quite often what happens is beauty doesn't even get into the equation, right? So it has to be in there. Then we have to ask the question, okay, so how important is that? amongst our natural assets? And the answer is, it's usually enormously important because the health benefits, the education benefits, the, I mean, I'm being crude about this in an economic way, but the tourist benefits, the, 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 the whole sense of well-being we get, that's really crucial. And actually, quite interestingly, it'll show up in lots of other things too, because in, in, in maintaining that beauty, you will probably have to protect all sorts of environmental things around that. Um, I'll give you a very long answer, but um, that's a challenge. I don't think it's outside the calculation. If it isn't in the calculation, then natural capital is not really helping us to get very far. Okay? On the trade issue, incredibly important. Okay? You, trade is not just about price. It's about quality. Right? And there's nothing on earth that stops we, us saying these are the requirements of the border. So I've been very deeply involved in trying to work out how we should make people pay a carbon border tax. So we're not cutting steel production in Britain and importing it from China and increasing our carbon consumption, as, by the way, we have been doing. And carbon consumption is the only way to measure it. Well, this is just the same problem. It's perfectly practical. It's perfectly doing, doable. And my final point is this. Imagine we don't. That will be a way of trashing our environment to protect British countryside. Global environment for British benefit. That's what we've done quite a lot in climate change by not having a border tax adjustment. This is utterly crucial. And if I was a farmer, I'd worry vastly more about cheap, environmentally weak imports coming in and taking my profits and my markets than I would worry about public goods for public money here. Uh, and that's crucial. But I could discuss that at length. Thank you. So we've run out of time for this session. We're breaking out, and, and that was perfectly timed. We're yeah. break, breaking out now into three different groups. And I so, suppose my plea to you all as chair of the Environment Agency is that when we have these discussions, we think about all the, all the players across the country that are involved in it because it's by and but also all of the themes as well so natural capital that it touches the environment the economy health well-being joining up the dots is going to be absolutely essential to getting this right and we've got such an opportunity to get it right so i hope you will join me in thanking dieter for his great speech and his question.